Okay, I'm trying not to get worried about the prosecution of Brian Koberger, but a couple of things have come up that make you go, okay, I hope prosecutors and cops have it in the bag. I hope they have enough solid evidence as they claim, but a couple of things are worrying me. Is there really only one video in the Idaho 4 discovery, technically known as the State of Idaho versus Brian Koberger? So we've got 1,865 photos, a 995 page document, but only one video slash audio file? Also, let's talk about what's even more troubling is a reporter. He has covered this case from across the country. He stood in front of the 1122 King Road house and even got frightened when an officer kind of lit him up and said, be careful, sir, it's slippery out here, all the way to Brian Koberger's home in Pennsylvania, outside of Albrightsville, a half an hour away, this reporter found a store with a display case full of gleaming long knives. And I've confirmed today, finally, this store does sell tons of K-Bar knives. But this reporter, as we're going to talk about, talked to the manager and the manager said, no, the cops haven't asked them anything about Brian Koberger being a customer there or had them pull their files or anything. So let's go into all of that right now. So I know it's still really early in the case. I mean, today is January 31st after all. However, at this stage in the game against Koberger, why is there only one video or audio file? Why was I able to scroll through listings of so many K-Bar knives at a shop half an hour away from Koberger's home in Pennsylvania and find all these knives with the sheath similar to the one found in the 1122 King Road house and realize that cops perhaps haven't done all their due diligence in tracking down where Brian purchased this knife, if he purchased it at all. At least it could be ruled out as an option. But as far as this one audio video file that's been listed in the latest discovery, I hope the prosecutors are just for some reason counting it as one external drive that maybe can hold many terabytes of video files. It's weird because the last update, that's all they have listed in discovery. So it makes sense. There's at least 2000 photos thus far and nearly 1000 pages of documents, which really could bode for a strong case against Brian Koberger. But my question is if they would enumerate the photos and the pages of the document, why not do the same with the video? If they actually have hundreds of videos in Discovery at this point, which I really hope they do, why wouldn't they list it as hundreds, just like they listed the thousands of photos and document pages? Some days I tell myself, cops have a strong case against Koberger, it'll be fine. Other days I wonder, and I'm not the only one. Howard Blum, formerly a reporter for The Village Voice and The New York Times, is the man I'm talking about. He's traveled all the way from 1122 King Road, all the way to Pennsylvania, to cover and research this crime of the century, and maybe he's finding stuff that cops don't even know. No, I know, I know. Some people, there's a few on Reddit or wherever who are willing to just throw, toss Bloom out because he accidentally called Kaylee's dog, Murphy. He accidentally wrote Murphy's name was Morgan. Mistakes happen, brain farts happen, but I don't think that means we should toss the baby out with the bathwater because if you subscribe to Bloom's airmail site, like I did today, you'll learn all these different little snippets of stuff that was unknown. He was the one who before the 2020 and Dateline episodes even came out about this case, Bloom was the first place I read that there were like a gaggle of students standing in front of the 1122 King Road house, dazed and confused, you know, at nearly noon that November 13th, 2022 morning, dazed and confused that morning, they could only utter a single word, dead. And when I watched 2020 or Dateline, again, they all run together. One of the girls, one of the witnesses did say, that's what happened. They just said, oh, there are people like dead inside, dead. So the stories are lining up and he has interesting little tidbits if you go over and read it about a police captain changing into his uniform before hitting the scene and Brian Koberger's dad, Michael, only really being worried about the snow 
and really wanting to get out of town when it was time to avoid that snow when Michael was helping his son Brian drive back to Pennsylvania in December. That's part of the reason maybe why Brian claimed he took that winding route. So Michael may have thought, oh yeah, he's helping avoid the snow, but maybe that's the real reason Brian was driving on down and getting caught on the reader in Loma, Colorado, avoiding the cops. Probably little to his dad's knowledge. But in Bloom's article from January 28th, 2023, titled Chasing the Devil, the Eyes of a Killer, Part 2, he writes about a store only 30 minutes away from Koberger's home where the cops did not check for a knife purchase. That's only three days ago as of this filming. I feel like it's kind of maybe Detective 101 to canvas all the areas at least 30 minutes from Koberger's home. Not only his home in Pennsylvania that he shared with his parents because we don't know if he did purchase this K-Bar knife. We don't know when he purchased it. He may have purchased it back in Pennsylvania. It's only 23 miles from his home. I would think at least a 23 mile or more radius from his home and a 23 mile radius from stores in the Pullman, Washington area, maybe even the Moscow area. I know cops have called some people out west. That's how we knew about this K-Bar knife before the arrest affidavit even leaked. The information about the knife sheath, we knew about it because some store owner or manager told a reporter, oh, cops were calling about a knife, asking if we sell K-Bars. So if they did their due diligence out west, somewhere in Washington or Idaho, why wasn't it done in Pennsylvania? But it's really interesting, go over there, Bloom subtitles it, a cross country father and son drive becomes part of an intricate cat and mouse game. At the journey's end, two dozen police officers lay in wait. Cops calling around Washington or Idaho for K-Bar knife purchases, that's great, but we cannot assume Brian purchased it out west. Perhaps he got it from a friend, a family member who was a military member. Maybe not. You know, you don't have to be in the military to own a K-Bar. Or maybe Brian took a 23-mile drive away from his parents' house and picked up a knife from a nearby store on June 25th, 2022, the day he reportedly moved off left home, his mom bemoaned about his absence on Reddit, to drive out west. Did he tuck it away somewhere in his Hyundai Elantra in the glove compartment before snaking off to the west? You know, did he go as far as taping the knife in the underbelly somewhere of the car? Everyone wonders what he did with that knife. Everyone is wondering where is that knife? And even if Brian did, let's say, dispose of it somewhere along the route back, you know, in the Snake River or in this or that or over a mountain or who knows. It would still be very fruitful and helpful to cops to know if Brian ever purchased a knife. And oh my goodness, when you see all of these K-Bar knives, I couldn't believe it. All these knives that this particular store sells. It's, it's a beautiful store. It's for hunters and gatherers, obviously. I'm not into hunting, so some of that stuff is just, ugh. I'd probably cry if I saw a deer shot near me. But they even have beautiful clothing, but they have a large online collection of K-Bar knives, plethora of them. And Howard Bloom writes about being an eyewitness, literal eyewitness to all the gleaming knives they have in the store. To be fair, maybe cops called the store and questioned them about K-Bar knives. And maybe this particular manager didn't know that. I mean, after all, Howard says it's someone who identifies himself as a manager in the store. Maybe this particular manager didn't know if cops have called. You hope that's what it is. I mean, he said the manager, not the owner, but you would think a manager would know what's going on in his own store. But according to this manager, as of three days ago, cops have not done some digging. And I would think he would know because if cops had call the store or however they do their due diligence to find out, you know, run me through all your customer records, whatever you got. Does Koberger pop up here anywhere? Your online purchases, your in-store purchases, anywhere. 
I think the manager of a store would be privy to that because even if they went through the owner or a different person, I feel like everyone would know because that would kind of be a monumental task. The store has been around since 1972. Obviously, Koberger hasn't been around that long, but if they were searching the name Koberger to see if anyone in the family had purchased this knife or, or if Brian himself had purchased it, that would be a task because you would have to go through all of these computer records. You'd have to get your IT guy. You'd have to maybe go through old invoices or old records that weren't destroyed or what have you. I think everyone in the store would know. And the cops, all they would have to do is hopefully make a phone call and the onus would be on the store to say, oh yeah, we got a hit here. We do have a Koberger who made this purchase and whatever. But it seems like some pretty basic stuff wasn't done. It took me hours today searching through their Facebook page. It's called the Dunkel Burgers. <laughs> it's a funny name. It's a funny name. It's called the Dunkel Burgers Sports Outfitters. I was searching through all their photos just to see any photos of knives. I did see a few just here and there. I could confirm they sold them, but I did not see photos of the huge display cases of knives, which is what I wanted to see. But finally, thank God, I came upon their link, this shopdso.com knives, where it's Dunkelberger Sports Online, their knives, the fixed blade ones, and then specifically the K-Bar ones, they have ones I've never seen before. They have so many K-Bar knives. So while Blum witnessed in person these K-Bar knives there, and this shop, I saw a little comment. I mean, it looks like a great shop, so they shouldn't be harassed at all. I did see someone commenting, you know, cause they're really focused on a lot of guns and hunting. I saw someone comment like, oh, it's good to see you don't advertise your AK-47s, now take them off the shelves. So I knew there might be some weapons that weren't being advertised on Facebook, but might appear in the store. But I'm glad I was able to confirm with that website, the shop DSO, shop, basically, Dunkelburgers, Dunkelburgers. Isn't that weird that it's like Koberger, Dunkelburgers? But they shouldn't be associated with Koberger's. Dunkelburgers Sports Outfitters. So they do definitely sell a bunch of K-Bar knives online. So Blum, who is the airmail writer, he wrote, quote, the police have not found the long bladed knife used in the killings. And they have so far not been able to establish that Kohlberger owns such a weapon. At least to our knowledge, they haven't. Some things we can't assume here. He also said, and I have to wonder how conscientiously they are trying. Just a week ago, so this would have been around January 21st, 10 days ago, Howard wrote, just a week ago, I walked into Dunkelberger's on Main Street in Stroudsburg. It's a sporting goods store that might as well be an armory. Indeed, they, they have a lot of stuff. I don't, I don't know if he's seen the stuff online yet. There are walls mounted with racks of rifles and display cases lined with gleaming long bladed knives. And it's just about half an hour drive from the Koberger family home in Albrightsville. I did verify through Google Maps the address of this store and the Koberger family home in Albrightsville yes, are only 23 miles away. Bloom continued, it's the sort of local shop one might visit if one were looking to buy a knife. So I asked the man who identified himself as the manager if the police ever checked the store records to see if Brian Koberger had made a purchase. Now this is what the manager said, quote, nope, pretty surprising too, now that you mention it. And that answer right there does not put me at ease. With all the cops on this case, with all the researchers, with everyone out there, wouldn't someone take, I don't know how large of a radius you'd wanna take, but let me look at all the stores in the area of Brian Koberger's family home where he lived just months before the tragedy. And let me see if he purchased a knife from a store like this. I mean, it's a huge store, it's a beautiful store. No one should harass the store, in my opinion, because yeah, they sell these crazy looking knives, but of course some people just have them for self-protection. Some people just have them for hunting. Some people like to go fishing and maybe they're 
filleting a fish with one of these knives, they're not planning evil. Of course, Koberger is still only a suspect, but what if this suspect, Koberger, had in his mind what he was going to do before he even left to travel to Washington? Koberger might have, yeah, planned to be the next BTK, or he might have lied to himself if he's the one who really did it and told himself, I'm just going to get this knife for my own protection. Either way, the point is, I'm pretty surprised, like this store's manager who was reporting that cops have not called their store to say, hey, can you run through those records to see if a Koberger pops up? And we don't know if Brian ever laid foot in the store. I couldn't see any photos of him. But if there is evidence there, at least that would be almost like a smoking gun too. And I don't even know if knives have serial numbers or any special etchings or things that guns would carry. More individual means of literally, you know, associating a certain gun with a certain bullet or what have you. But it would be one step closer to proving who did this, eventually maybe even finding the weapon. But if that store really hasn't even been called yet to say, hey, run the name Koberger through your system, that worries me. Kind of like the singular video that's sitting in Discovery, according to the last information we see here. First of all, let me just warn you, if you ever see someone claiming they have a link to download the entire Discovery, all these photos and documents in one video, please don't click it. The official Cases of Interest page for the State of Idaho Judicial Branch is right there on coi.isc.idaho.gov. You can go there yourself. The district court cases on the page are updated every Friday. And if you just scroll, the first case you'll see is the state of Idaho versus Brian C. Koberger. You'll see the documents. You'll see Latah County CR, that's criminal, CR 29-22-2805. That's his case number. So some people are a little confused and they're thinking, oh, you know, they see these news reports about this discovery and they're like, where can we find these photos and videos and video? Where can we find these photos and video and documents? And I think there might be some nefarious links out there saying, oh, find the discovery here. If you've been following the Doomsday Mom case, Lori Vallow and Charles Daybell as well, you'll see that case. So the main thing I can like in Brian Koberger's case too at this point in my mind, one of those modern day horrific crimes is the Chris Watts case. We know Chris Watts pled guilty Tuesday, November 6, 2018 to doing away with his pregnant wife, Shanann Watts and their two daughters in Frederick, Colorado. So the crime happened August 13th, 2018 and already by November 6, 2018, Chris Watts was pleading guilty. The only lawyer I saw call it correctly on YouTube, the only one I saw back then was Scott Reich. He predicted it. He said, Watts is probably going to plead guilty. Everyone else, a lot of other people were like, oh no, he won't plead, he'll take it out. And so you never know what a suspect is going to do. Even though many of us are thinking, yeah, Koberger probably won't enter a guilty plea anytime soon. And he's gonna, can't wait to be exonerated. So he probably will take it to trial and all that. You never know. Chris Watts was avoiding the death penalty, but you never know what to expect in different cases. So pretty soon after, on November 21st, 2018, the Weld County District Attorney in Colorado released a 2000 page document. It was like 1960 pages. It was known as the discovery. That was the prosecution's evidence against Chris Watts. But everything wasn't out then. So I know discovery of course builds upon time. That's why, why in Koberger's case do they have nearly 2000 photos in discovery, but only one video. Nearly a thousand pages of documents, which is great. The big numbers are great. It shows all the work, the evidence likely against him, but why one video? And people think, yeah, they know what they're doing. Leave it to the cops, leave it to law enforcement, leave it to the judicial system. Yeah, a lot of them of course know what they're doing, but sometimes you run into problems and you see the technology that's lacking when it comes to videos, because video is different. Video is huge. 
So it would take until May of 2019 for more discovery to emerge in the Watts case, such as all the photos and videos of Chris Watts with his mistress, Nicole Kessinger, and even years later for more videos to be released. So in the Watts case, discovery was coming out, you know, a year later, nearly a year later. It was interesting because everything wasn't apparent. You know, people were trying to keep stuff hidden. Chris Watts was using that secret calculator app to store photos and videos of Nicole Kessinger, his mistress. And Nicole wasn't giving up that information anytime soon. So it took stealthy cops, great detectives who know their way around technology to finally uncover all that secretive stuff in the phone, which they may have thought was deleted. So that's why I get it. Discovery can take time to build. And if in the Koberger case, if his preliminary hearing still happens after a few months in June, of course, Discovery will build, but hopefully we'll see a lot more than one video pop up in there. So if you know, the world turns on his axis and Brian ends up pleading guilty to try and save his own hide. Once he sees all this evidence stacked up against him, that's another reason hopefully he'll see more than one video stacked up against him. Perhaps they have the video of him, you know, the Linda Lane video of his car racing away. We don't know what they have. Other videos maybe along the way, or who knows what surveillance should be in discovery to say, aha, Brian, aha, see, we got you here, we got you here, we got you there. Your toast, plead guilty to save your life, which is grace that the perpetrator did not give the four victims. But if Brian did plead guilty, we could see the release of the discovery instead of watching his scheduled preliminary hearing at 9 a.m., judicial officer, Judge Megan Marshall in courtroom one, June 26, 2023 through June 30th, if they need five days, maybe we'd see the release of discovery coming sooner or later instead of looking forward to some long trial. But as of January 23rd, 2023, the state's response to the request for discovery in the state of Idaho versus Brian Koberger, Brian Christopher Koberger, it shows that the state has complied and will continue to comply with request for discovery from the prosecuting attorney, Ann Taylor, who we've seen. So it was on January 10th, 2023, when Ann Taylor, attorney Taylor, filed Brian's request for discovery pursuant to ICR 16. That's Idaho Criminal Rule 16, discovery and inspection. And I'll leave the link below if you feel like becoming a lawyer and reading all that stuff. But it does include rules about mandatory disclosure of evidence and material by the prosecution and disclosure of evidence and materials by the prosecution on written request. It does cover digital media recordings, audio and video file. On request, the prosecuting attorney must release to defendant digital media that may or may not contain protected information as defined by this rule. And it talks about unredacted digital media, disclosure of evidence based on some written request. Basically, Koberger's request included a long list of 18 subject areas that Ann Taylor wants from the prosecutor, including statements from Brian Koberger and any co-defendants, if there are any, Koberger's prior record, if there is any, documents, tangible evidence, exams and tests, state and expert witnesses. And that gets a little tricky because you don't want to give this suspect too much data or personal details on potential witnesses. Police reports, digital media recordings, audio and video files, both redacted and unredacted, search warrants, exculpatory evidence, stuff that could clear him, inducement, ID, evidence, electronic surveillance, drug tests, subpoenas, certifications. So Koberger demands compliance, which is all, I guess, pretty standard from the state within 14 days of the service of those requests on January 10th. So right under the deadline, it would have been due January 24th. The state gets their response in right under the deadline. They filed it on January 23rd, 2023. The state's response to the request for discovery came in a day early, but are they several videos short? That's what folks are wondering. The state wrote about any books or papers, documents, photos, tangible objects, 
all this stuff which are in the possession, custody, control of the prosecuting attorney and which are material to the preparation of the defense or intended for use by the prosecutor as evidence at trial or obtained from or belonging to Koberger have been or will be disclosed or otherwise made available. Now this is the Exhibit A which brings the biggest question in the way they enumerate this evidence. They talk about deputies and officers from the Lataw County Sheriff's Office, Idaho State Police, Moscow Police Department, Idaho Fish and Game, and other law enforcement agencies may record their law enforcement contacts via an audio recorder or an audio video recorder, which could be, you know, body cam, dash cam, whatever. Any audio and video recordings related to this matter are available for review and duplication on request, subject to the provisions of this ICR 16 rule. But when it comes down to Exhibit A, police reports and documents covered by ICR 16, which are in the possession of the state, have been disclosed to counsel for the defendant as of January 23rd, 2023. This is what it says. These materials consist of pages numbered 1 through 995, audio slash video, AV, and it has a bunch of zeros, and then the number one, as if it's only one video or one audio file, even worse. Photos, then they have PH a bunch of zeros and then a one through PH a bunch of zeros and then 1865. I mean, that's great. Nearly 2,000 photos, nearly 1,000 pages of documentation, but audio video, one? I don't know what on earth is happening. If you're in the true crime community on this end of the camera, we've seen cases where cops, especially those in like smaller or mid-sized cities, have a problem handling the huge amounts of space that it takes to transfer videos from one place to another. Even when the Chris Watts discovery was first released to the public, it didn't go smoothly. So many people hit up that Google Drive that it crashed. It failed, it was shut down. So Weld County instituted a means of where you could request the discovery through from the DA, but not everything that was in the first discovery that maybe one or two people were able to grab showed up in the second discovery. So you had these like mismatch discoveries. And don't even talk about the case of Barry Morphew out of Salida, Colorado, whose wife, Suzanne Morphew, she's still missing, unfortunately. Chafee County forced us to purchase CDs to obtain video evidence in his discovery after he was arrested, but the charges were dropped. It's crazy. And in that case, if you watch those court hearings, painfully so, Barry Morphew's bulldog of a lawyer. One was really more of a bulldog than the other. The whole thing was about, we need discovery, we need discovery, we need discovery. Oh my goodness, Barry's prosecutors, the state, kept coming up with excuses like, oh, of course we can't put all this stuff online. I get it, they wouldn't want discovery to get hacked and you know, you find all these videos you shouldn't find before the trial happens. But it was just too much back and forth. Like, why can't you take a big, huge external drive or a big CPU or a big something and dump everything on that? The state, here, here's discovery so no one else would have access to this tower of info still kept secret but here here's your discovery it feels like video evidence in some cases like the mystery of kylie rodney's accidental drowning the chp denied a request for that or some body cam footage videos like the case of andrea mccray as you recently saw i just covered her case they get released in due time and she was cleared of any alleged wrongdoing even the case which i just requested again chad wheeler he's a seattle seahawks guy who basically knew nearly ended the life of his girlfriend, Aaliyah Taylor. From that body cam footage, TMZ only got snippets and it was just a bunch of audio, probably because the last time I requested it, they want $600 to redact 21 videos. Chad Wheeler allegedly has three cops on his back and pushes back this huge football guy and gets all three cops up off of him or three cops could not contain him. Can you believe we have not seen that video yet? And Chad Wheeler has been sitting in his luxurious house arrest for years now, it feels, 
Finally, we have a court date coming up, which I hope they stick to. We'll see if it really goes down this time for Chad Wheeler, March 27th, 2023. So video evidence is important, and there's really different reasons why it might not come out as smoothly as the public thinks it will. Courts aren't always the best at handling videos. I'm wondering, is that why Brian's video discovery is so lacking right now. I can only imagine the tons of video evidence that I hope and pray in Jesus' name that prosecution has against him. Let's hope this discovery is chock full of videos by June. There's also been a response to the request for a discovery. Brian Koberger's January 30th, 2023, which would just be yesterday, Monday, his response to the request for discovery is out there. I guess we'll see it by Friday, hopefully earlier, to see what he says about this latest document. And also, if you haven't seen it, there is a page set up by the Gonzalez family. It's called Idaho Murders, the Gonzalez family page. It's for the public to reach out if you have any tips or leads that could be helpful. Hey, this is Steve. Um, we uh, put together a new page to uh, help with all the communications that was coming sometimes to Olivia, sometimes to Shannon, sometimes to my wife, me. Um, so we just put together a family page. Uh, uh, the name's brand new. Um, so Idaho Murders, Gonzalez family page. But it's real, it's legit, and that's to help us organize. So if you want to send information there, um, we're trying to keep it all in one place. Thank you. Some people think the Gonzalvises should keep their mouth shut. And you know what? My response to that is when you have daughters brutally slaughtered, maybe then you can talk, but I don't blame the Gonzalvises for doing what they're doing. I mean, perhaps this knife store might feel more comfortable going to the Gonzalvises family page on Facebook and telling them what they know since the cops, according to Howard Bloom, haven't contacted them. But on the Gonzalez's Facebook page, you get to see more of Kaylee and the victims being humanized. They have gorgeous photos. They have just a great video of Kaylee dancing, <laughs> running man on that beat. <laughs> and she, she looks so cute, just full of life, just beautiful. So, you know, I'll link to that below too, if you haven't had a chance to go over there. Steve just has a message from Mr. Gonzalez. He just wants, you know, tips. I don't think he's trying to interfere, but I don't blame him. That's worrisome to think maybe cops haven't covered everything or maybe they don't have the bandwidth or we shall see. We'll keep our eye on this case and hope for a conviction if Brian is guilty. For now, let's close with Psalm 86.5. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call to you. And that's the most important part, calling to him in every situation. And hopefully he's all in the midst of this to get it wrapped up with justice for the victims. Thank you for watching.